welcome everybody to this webinar on Arctic observing systems. What, why, who, and how to improve. This webinar is part of the Arctic Passion online seminar and dialogue series. And today we will learn about the Arctic observing systems, uh, what we are observing, why, and who does it, which projects or organizations are involved. And we'll also cover what data are produced and how to improve the data coverage in the Arctic and the Arctic Ocean across space, time, and disciplines. And we will also talk about the importance and the role of indigenous and local knowledge and how everything is connected. Um, my name is Lisa Großfeld, and I'm project officer of the um, Apex Project office um, located uh, at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany. And APEX, um, maybe you have heard of it, it's uh, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, and maybe some of you in the audience are also our members, so special welcome to you as well. Um, as APEX, we are responsible for the education and training activities in the Arctic Passion Project. And with us today is also my close colleague Sabrina Herima from Grit Arendal, and she is involved in the Arctic Passion Project and responsible for the communication of the project. And she's here for monitoring your questions and um, the chat. Um, but I want to especially welcome today our three speakers, Michael Karcher, Arez Sundfjord, and uh, Margaret Rudolph. And thanks especially to Margaret, uh, who is getting, was getting up so early in the morning. So thank you. Um, and Michael and Arel, they are both part of the Arctic Passion Project. And Margaret Rudolph is uh, the indigenous liaison uh, of the RNA Corps project with whom uh, the Arctic um, Passion Project is collaborating. Just for you um, who are not too familiar with the Arctic um, Passion Project, um, it is generally yeah, a four-year EU project that aims at the creation of a coherent, integrated Arctic observing system um, to monitor environmental changes there. And the focus is really on co-creation of knowledge um, and also especially with local and indigenous communities. And that the services we develop in the project are suitable for Arctic citizens. Um, just some technical things before we uh, get started. Um, please note that yeah, the webinar is being recorded and we'll later post it on uh, the Apex Vimeo channel and the Arctic Passion YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, always drop them in the chat or in the Q&A box, but preferably in the chat. Um, we'll take them up, um, some after the uh, presentations, and um, in the end, we'll have some time for questions as well. Um, yeah, but now let's get started. Um, we'll start with uh, Michael Kacha. Um, so welcome. Um, he is working at the Alfred Wegener Institute and he's the co coordinator of Arctic Passion. And who today he will give us an overview about Arctic observing systems what those are, who is involved, and what it is for, and also will show you a little bit the role of the Arctic Passion Project in it. So, please, Michael, <laughs> welcome. Yeah, hello, everyone, and um, thank you for, for dialing in uh, to our webinar. Thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. And um, yeah, I will try to give you a very uh, broad overview of uh, Arctic observing and uh, some of the observing system components which are in place. In 15 minutes, I can't do that, can't do anyone uh, justice uh, or everyone justice um, and every scene justice. Uh, so uh, please be uh, 
um, patient and ask questions if there is anything missing which you would have wanted me to uh, chime in on. Um, I will also touch Arctic Passion in the very end, very briefly, um, but uh, due to the time limits, I'll focus on this general overview. So, uh, yeah, Arctic Passion is dealing with Arctic observations, and um, as um, Lisa already mentioned, um, we are dealing with um, environmental observations in the Arctic uh, on many, on many, um, in many domains. Um, one of the foci on of Arctic observations is, of course, detecting and understanding change, um, and especially on the longer time scales. Um, this is uh, nowadays very much linked to the climate change, and uh, one of the um, phenomena which you have been uh, hearing about for sure is Arctic amplification, which is um, the fact that in the Arctic, the change which has been observed due to rising temperatures in the atmospheric, um, in the atmosphere of the Earth uh, is much larger in the Arctic than elsewhere on the globe. Um, here we see results from a recent paper from Rantanen et al. showing the temperature curve uh, from different um, temperature observation recordings around the globe. And in the strong colored curves, you can identify those data for the Arctic, whereas in the, um, oops, whereas uh, the, the grayish colors show the global data. And you can see that in the Arctic in the last decades, we have a much stronger increase, four times as much in some cases as um, in some regions of the Arctic as compared to the global mean. One of the consequences of this strong temperature rise, and this is also subject to observation activities in the Arctic, uh, is of course the sea ice. It may be one of the most prominent topics uh, for many who are not living in the Arctic. Um, the sea ice cover, especially in summer, has been shrinking over the past decades. Here you see uh, a, um, a figure on the left-hand side showing from NSIDC, the satellite um, product showing the extent of the Arctic sea ice this summer. And the orange curve curve shows you where the extent has been sitting at uh, in the mean or the median, the ice edge uh, between 1981 and 2010. And you can see that also this year is a year with a minimum ice extent below the average. On the right hand side, you see the long term curve based on satellite records, and you can see a strong decline of summer sea ice extent. Um, in the in the uh, long term, you see that there is also a lot of variability on the interannual time scale, which is also subject to research, of course, and observation, understanding those fluctuations. But um, yeah, the long term trend is very obvious. One of the reasons why we are trying to underst better understand the Arctic uh, and its change. Uh, due to climate change, but also due, due to uh, internal natural variability is uh, the role of the Arctic in the global climate system. And this is just a sketch um, taken from the Grid Arendal website, showing some of the uh, feedbacks uh, which are taking place in the Arctic and which are subject not only to process studies in the Arctic, but also to long-term observational um, campaigns um, the importance of the Arctic is uh, for the globe is in some, uh, to some extent based on the um, reflection of the Earth's surface, uh, whether it's made of sea ice or ocean surface or land or ice and snow, uh, having very different reflective properties, which then has an impact on the energy budget of the um, region and the feedback to the global sphere. There is also exchange of the oceans and the atmospheric um, domains in the Arctic with the rest of the globe. And what happens in the Arctic has an impact on what's, um, what's happening further south. So this is one of the uh, issues uh, we are looking at in the observing systems. 
Um, but not only ocean, ice, and uh, atmosphere are a focus of observations, it's also the land sphere. One prominent example here is the permafrost layers of uh, very thick, um, permanently frozen um, earth or soil. Uh, and this, as a consequence of the climate change, is also uh, thawing, uh, thawing away in many cases. And some of the uh, observing activities are related to trying to detect those changes. On the right hand side, you see examples of satellite uh, derived data which try to identify changes in the landscape. Uh, in the surface, for example, lake drainage, like in the middle panel, um, or coastal erosion, uh, shown in the bluish colors on the right-hand side in the, on the figure. For some strange reason, my cursor, ah, oh, here's my cursor, okay. The figure on the left-hand side shows uh, the projected change in the permafrost for two different climate change scenarios um, projected uh, from today to, to the year 2100. And you can see that the area which is covered by uh, permafrost is shrinking in, this, in these climate change projections. Um, there's also one other aspect which is uh, subject to research and monitoring in the Arctic, and this is uh, the consequences of human impact on the Arctic. On the left-hand side, for example, you see a figure which depicts invasive species and the pathways by which they are entering uh, into the Arctic. It's partly due to ocean currents, but it's also due to uh, shipping uh, activities and um, uh, the water which is carried with the sh those ships, which is then uh, released in Arctic waters and um, species which are um, carried with these waters are, are set free in the Arctic and um, inv inv are invasive species for the local uh, ecosystem. On the right hand side, you can, can see depictions of long range pollutant transport into the Arctic in the air, which is shown in this large uh, northward uh, reaching arrows, but also in the ocean, with the ocean circulation, which uh, carries, for example, pollutants from the European regions, the highly populated shelf regions, uh, into the Arctic with the Norwegian coastal current, and then into the Barents Sea and uh, the Central Arctic. But one thing which we should never forget is that the Arctic is inhabited. There are many people living there, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a map showing settlements of uh, local and indigenous people living in the Arctic regions. And those are, of course, very much affected by everything which is going on in, with respect to climate change, with respect to pollution, and um, the way uh, how these um, settlements and those communities can make their living and can live in a healthy uh, fashion, in a healthy way, is very much impacted by what's going on um, in, in, in the Arctic. And so um, everything impacting those populations is also subject of Arctic monitoring activities. And you can see that the variety of people, uh, how they live in the Arctic is, is very large. You have uh, indigenous groups, uh, communities, which are migrant or settled. You have fishing fleets uh, acting there from local population, large fishing fleets and small coastal fishing boats. You even have large settlements. As an example, here on the top left, there's uh, a photograph of Tromsø in Northern Norway. So as you may imagine then, uh, for Arctic observing, uh, there's a multitude of goals and interests, methods and actors uh, in the Arctic. And it's necessary that these are coordinated in a certain way. Many nations and many actors in the Arctic, research teams, local population are having their own uh, ways of um, measuring different components of the system. And ideally, if we want to understand the change of the entire system as a whole in a more holistic fashion, we have to better coordinate this. And one way to do this, um, based on in the, uh, the research community, 
is coordinated international experiments. Here is an example of the mosaic drift. Um, some of you may have heard about this. It was a, a one-year drift of the research vessel, vessel Polarstern frozen into the ice uh, in the central Arctic and then drifting with the ice over an entire year to sample data to better understand the seasonal change of sea ice, ocean, ecosystem in and under the ice and the atmosphere. So this is one way of collaboration to understand the changes which are going on and the processes which are going on in the Arctic. In the land sphere, one example is an international coordinated network called Interact. Um, this is also a partner in Arctic Passion and they are encompassing 68 terrestrial field bases which are taking regular observations and coordinate their uh, results. Uh, it covers re the entire Arctic region, but what you can also uh, see, already see here on this figure, the colored ones are all those who are not in Russia, and the gray ones are in Russia. They previously have belonged to the Interact network, but due to the current uh, geopolitical situation and the consequence of the war of Russia against Ukraine and the sanctions, the collaboration with Russian institutions is on hold. This is posing a big problem for research and collaboration in the Arctic, because as you see here, uh, the Russian territory uh, comprises a large part of the Arctic. In the ocean, some examples of coordinated observing systems are shown here. One of them is the Arctic, uh, is the uh, Bofojaya observing system. It's a coordinated uh, marine observing um, system with moored um, with with moorings in the ocean and also with um, ship expeditions carrying out surveys in those regions um, between Alaska and Greenland in the Central Arctic Ocean. And another one about which uh, Adel will tell you more later on is the distributed observatory. Uh, system in the in the Arctic, also an oceanic or a marine observing system um, uh, component. Um, however, we shouldn't forget that there is not only, uh, let's say, classical uh, Western style science. There are also um, important uh, knowledges which are, or there's important knowledge which is stemming from the very very long. Um, knowledge systems of indigenous people living in the Arctic and local people living in the Arctic. And I'm just showing examples here um, of work which is done to um, preserve and um, capture the knowledge carried on with the, by, by elders, uh, in this case uh, comprised in a book on the uh, Gwich'in, uh, which are living in the um, Northwestern uh, North American uh, region and um, also an article uh, written which is um, focusing on how science must embrace traditional and indigenous knowledge to uh, solve problems which are um, inherent for us now. What we can learn from these systems is a lot and it includes um, a more holistic way of understanding the system. And uh, another example, of work uh, together with local population in the Arctic is community-based observation. Um, this is focusing on involving local population in um, cooperative activities on uh, taking samples which are of uh, importance for their own um, for their own purposes in regions here. An example of field work in West Greenland on marine capturing marine noise pollution. This is one of the pilot services which are done in Arctic Passion. And then on the bottom, you can see an example of a uh, co-development of a community-centered regional early warning and uh, early warning and response system, um, which has been set up in Alaska. And you can see important components uh, cr in, of creating an, uh, in a community-based observing system uh, in a region which uh, reaches from the actual observational data uh, via important aspects um, like uh, identification of indicators 
and the creation of uh, co community produced maps, which then can serve the purposes of the communities. One further important aspect, if we look at the Arctic um, observing system uh, ecosystem in, uh, from, from, from afar, let's say in a kind of bird's view, are the different uh, and many um, organizations which are involved in Arctic observing planning and coordination. And this may be looking a bit confusing to you, but here we try to sort the landscape a little bit in sorting uh, the system into different elements. On the top here in blue, you can see examples of, uh, you, you can see observing system elements, which I just mentioned in the previous slides, like the community-based observing space-borne systems um, and in situ observing systems. Those are the direct observations um, on the land or in the ocean. Then, of course, you have as one important group the people uh, living in the Arctic, um, the economic, economic actors uh, like businesses. You have the decision makers and policy makers, which have a say in what's going on in the Arctic. Then you have service providers, which are, uh, for example, providing satellite services like ESA, the European Space Agency, or Copernicus. You have research institutions and international projects. I have shown a few examples of those. And then you have somehow science policy uh, organizations like the World Meteorological Organization or the International Arctic Science Committee and political organizations like the Arctic Council. And they all have a say in what's going on and projects which are dealing with an Arctic observing system have to take all these, um, all these actors into account and try to navigate this. Two examples for projects who try to do that are Intaros and Arctic Passion. Intaros is a project which uh, has just finished and is the predecessor to Arctic Passion. Um, this is an this figure is an example of um, their assessment of in situ observing systems, um, which again are those who are taking direct uh, samples and direct observations on land or in the ocean or on sea ice. Um, and uh, they have been trying to put together uh, lists and overviews of the status of these observing systems and what they are providing and how they can be better uh, coordinated. And Archie Passion, uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa mentioned that already, is a follow-up project which started last year. It will run for four years. We have many partners, uh, which is partly due to this, uh, let's say, complicated landscape or ecosystem of actors in the Arctic. Um, it comprises also institutions from 18 countries and six indigenous communities. And we are trying to improve the coordination and cooperation of uh, Arctic observing on the terrestrial domain in the oceans and uh, in the atmosphere. And we are doing that with activities spread over the entire Arctic. Uh, since this February without the Russian partners, uh, which are still on this slide. I mentioned that already. So just to give you a very quick view on how are we doing that, we have a large project which is separated into three main pillars. One pillar is working to strengthen the observing system elements, which would be those I mentioned in the beginning like actual observations, like coordinated uh, activities, and uh, also providing some services. And then the second pillar would be the one dealing with all the science, uh, the, all the decision-making support, uh, the international collaboration and the uh, policy uh, interaction. And then one uh, pillar, which is dealing with outreach and um, synthesis of everything. So I'm coming to an end now and end with this slide, which is showing the overall project objectives of Arctic Passion. And um, yeah, again, this is a, uh, to create a coherent, integrated and sustainable pan-Arctic observing system. 
uh, with a strong inclusion of indigenous knowledge and local knowledge uh, and improving of uh, monitoring of uh, Arctic of the Arctic domain. Okay, and I'll stop here. I think my time is over, if not overrun. Thank you, Michael, for for the overview. Um, if there are no specific questions um, to the presentation, we can still take them up in the end. Um, and then I would just go to the next presentation. Oh, well, there is one question. Um, how is the coordination of such a large, large ecosystem going so far? <laughs> Status quo. Yeah, maybe maybe that's something to discuss in the very end uh, with everyone involved. So um, I've, I've taken already a bit more time than I was assigned, so I don't want to take it away from Arvid. Um, probably the answer is a bit longer than, than it should be right now. I will jump in here since I'm monitoring the questions. There is a, a few coming in now. How much knowledge gap is created due to Russian non-involvement in art? Is there a way to improve it? Yeah, at the moment, there is hardly any way to improve it because um, there is no fieldwork possible in Russia uh, and also the connection to many Russian scientists and scientific institutions is interrupted. Um, so there's no way at the moment to fill it in. Uh, the satellites, of course, cover also the Russian regions. But on the long run, of course, we hope um, that there will not only be an end to the war, but also an end to this interruption of interaction and collaboration. Yeah, thank you. Another one is, are there any books or reports being published with the results of the research? Well, there are always, uh, of course, scientific um, scientific papers which cover the actual science results but then there are also a number of um, let's say more easily digestible uh, outputs uh, created on our website for example and maybe Sabrina you just put in the website again um, where you can find little news articles and uh, descriptions uh, about parts of our work which we are doing right now or which are accomplished. And then there's also a section on the website which has some reports and deliverables which can be looked at. Yeah, I will do that. And uh, the last question, since we're only accepting three at the moment, is can you say more about the categorization made by Intaros in respect to the observing system? That's a longish rep report. <laughs> it's difficult to refer to that in a few words. Um, I think what they did is very helpful as a starting point for us, having identified already gaps uh, where they are uh, prominent. Um, it starts with uh, problems with the interoperability of data taken, uh, which means that those data are not easy to find by automatic um, systems, uh, which would be the final goal, so that the, the, the results from the many different people acting as uh, or taking uh, measurements in the Arctic can be put together into one system and analyzed as as a whole. So that is certainly one big gap on which also we are trying to work further. Another one is, of course, the big gap in the Central Arctic Ocean on data in particular for the ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. And now I'd like to give the word to Arild Sundford. He, he's an oceanographer at the Norwegian Polar Institute and is also working in the Arctic Passion Project and is leading a working group in there. So please, Arild. Yeah, thanks very much, Lisa. Um, thanks, Mikael, for the overview. That gives me a good starting point. So I'll dive into one of the many elements of um, of this uh, observing system of systems, um, looking at the uh, mar marine domain, looking at sea ice uh, and um, the ocean, the water column below the sea ice in the interior Arctic Ocean. 
Um, if you remember the overview map that Mikhail showed with uh, uh, existing or previous uh, uh, observations taking place, it was mostly a big gap in the interior Arctic Ocean, and we want to do something about that. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the ice, uh, ice cover is shrinking, but it does make the, uh, the area more accessible. So we do think uh, it is more feasible now to, uh, to increase the observational coverage in the interior Arctic Ocean. So the, the idea with this presentation is to give you an, an overview of the key elements that are needed to um, collect comprehensive observations that give us kind of a holistic picture of what goes on inside that ocean area. Um, and how these elements have to be integrated and, um, and coordinated for, for this to be successful. Uh, and there are three main things that I want to, to uh, discuss. Uh, Ship-based campaigns, which are the only way of bringing lots of instruments and lots of people into the area to do the details uh, and collect really interdisciplinary measurements that we need. The second element is long-term instrument installations or ocean moorings uh, that allow us to capture most of the water column and what lives inside it to some extent. And the third element is drifting sea ice buoys and uh, instruments that can be uh, attached to, this, to the drifting sea ice uh, on the under, underside. So we believe that all of these are needed and they must be appropriately coordinated for us to, to get a good view of what's going on inside this uh, uh, area. Um, and of course, uh, while I don't talk more about those elements, we need to integrate these uh, in situ or locally collect the data with uh, remote sensing from satellites or other airborne means and with uh, numerical models to understand uh, why things are changing as we see. Uh, so starting with the ship-based uh, observations, why, why do we need to have those when we have good remote sensing products coming out and more autonomous uh, vehicles, etc.? Well, um, it is a very complicated system with lots of detail in it. I'll mention just a couple of examples that we cannot cover by other means, and that is actually with people out on the on the sea ice collecting samples of, for example, pollution in the snow or uh, the exchange of gas uh, between the atmosphere and the ocean through the sea ice, or what's living in the ocean. You, you still need net samples and trawl holes to, to capture the organisms that live there, to, uh, to see what's there, how many are they, and uh, uh, what their condition is. Um, so to make this um, successful internationally, we need to plan our uh, research expeditions with the few ships that we have. We need to uh, allow others to come on board on our expeditions to put together uh, teams that are collaborative and complementary. And um, it's not always possible to have everybody on board. So we need to be willing to take samples for people who cannot come on board. I think that's the main message here that if we work together on this, it's, uh, there's lots of opportunities that we haven't fully harnessed yet. Uh, so the, the photo on the right-hand side so it shows um, the key instrumentation that we use for, for the water column, I would say, uh, from the surface to the bottom. You lower this uh, instrument package with uh, uh, lots of water bottles on it. Uh, they can be closed at different depths and take water samples that we can use to analyze for uh, trace metals or for pollution or for organisms or nutrients uh, that allow uh, growth in the water uh, by algae. And it also has a suite of different sensors that capture, uh, for example, light or oxygen levels, uh, salinity and temperature. So that's a key instrument you see on that uh, picture on the lower right hand side. Um, as an example, uh, for the next few slides, I'll, I'll use um, uh, figures from um, an expedition that we had with our research vessel Kung Prince Håkon uh, in July and August of this uh, year. Uh, starting out north of Svalbard and then going to the North Pole, mostly uh, through rather open and thin ice, uh, as is illustrated by these green dots on the left-hand panel, and then actually starting uh, most of the scientific work at the North Pole and along this um, straight line that goes from the Northwest to back, back more or less back to where we started. Um, 
And one example of data collected with this instrument package that I showed in the previous slide uh, is uh, um, a, what we call a transect or a vertical slice of the ocean. Um, on the left-hand side, you see temperature from the uh, surface to the bottom. Um, from the western or northwestern part of this uh, ship transect towards the shore north of Svalbard, so crossing two deep ocean basins. Um, so what the temperature figure shows is that there is very cold Arctic water near the surface, and then a layer um, below that of Atlantic water, which is much warmer and contains lots of nutrients and, uh, to some extent, organisms that normally live in the northern uh, Atlantic Ocean. And when you approach the uh, uh, southern end of the transect towards Svalbard, you see that this Atlantic water layer is much thicker and, uh, and at the very end, it actually comes all the way up to the surface. So this is an area where you find lots of Atlantic uh, or organisms and, uh, and actually uh, associated fisheries in the later years. And on the right-hand side, a uh, figure of salinity, which is uh, key to understanding vertical exchanges in the ocean, so how much of these nutrients can actually be transported towards the surface where there is light for, for primary production. Um, and it also gives you a measure of how much freshwater input there is to the system from the rivers in Siberia or from melting sea ice. So this is just one example of how, how much you, you get out of stopping the ship and doing these profiles. Um, all these little black dots on, on both figures uh, show where we have taken water bottle samples for these various uh, substances or, or uh, analysis that I just mentioned. Um, the second element that I wanted to talk about is uh, uh, instruments installed more permanently in the water column. So what we do is place uh, one of these uh, moorings at a, uh, a suitable location. Uh, it's anchored to the bottom with uh, uh, some heavy iron uh, and then um, um, lots of instruments from there and uh, close to the underside of the sea ice. So in this particular example, which we deployed uh, one of in the Nansen Basin and one in the Amundsen Basin, so in the deep part of the uh, Eurasian Arctic Ocean, uh, we have uh, lots of these salinity and temperature uh, sensors, but also automatic water samplers, uh, nutrient sample, uh, um, we have um, uh, current meters that detect the ocean currents and also upward looking sonar, which uh, records the uh, thickness of the sea ice. Um, those are examples. There's actually more instrumentation here. Um, and they are located uh, where you see those two uh, stars inside the deep basin and nicely complement moorings that already exist uh, in the Fram Strait between Greenland and Svalbard, uh, which record the inflow of Atlantic water into the Arctic Ocean and the export of, uh, of uh, uh, fresh water, uh, fresher water and, and sea ice from the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and again, this coordination aspect is really important. Uh, we cannot have our own moorings all over the place uh, because they are logistically difficult to get out there and even more difficult to get back in uh, when you want to recover the data and, and replace batteries. Um, it's risky um, and we get more out of it if we collaborate both on uh, deciding which are the optimal locations for them, um, but also by uh, jointly providing instrumentation uh, for these expensive installations. So in these particular moorings, I think we are five institutions that provide uh, bits and pieces here and there to make them actually interdisciplinary and, uh, and much more powerful uh, when we get the data. Um, yep. Um, the next element is drifting sea ice buoys. Um, Again, you need a ship to get them out. And um, <clears throat> um, the basic version of, uh, of a sea ice buoy is uh, essentially a GPS uh, receiver and a satellite transmitter and a string of thermistors or temperature sensors that go through the snow and sea ice. Uh, with that basic kit, you can measure how the sea ice uh, uh, grows thicker uh, during winter and spring and how it uh, starts melting and uh, eventually disappears. Uh, in summer, maybe one year after deployment or maybe two years after. Um, so this um, uh, map on the left-hand side shows the drifting tracks of some of those buoys that were deployed uh, during last summer's cruise. 
Um, some of them are more complex. Uh, they can have uh, different sensors below the sea ice, uh, even at rather great depths, so that you can cover or understand how the uh, surface layer of the ocean uh, changes through, uh, with seasons and with the drift through geography. Uh, one example uh, shown in the photo on the right hand side is uh, uh, um, an acoustic uh, uh, echo sounder that records um, a biomass, uh, zooplankton, and to some extent uh, fish that live below the sea ice. So again, uh, by going together, uh, multiple institutions can provide uh, instruments for buoy clusters so that we better understand more of the system than only the hardcore sea ice parameters, for example. And again, um, uh, coordination of locations and timing is important so that we can cover spatially and temporally um, <clears throat> the area as well as possible. Um, yeah. Um, the example that I showed was from one cruise in one year, um, but of course we we need to go beyond beyond that. Um, so what we are aiming to do um, is to build up a, a system for the um, Atlantic side of the Arctic Ocean, where we um, collaborate much more strongly from the planning phase of expeditions uh, through uh, the phase of uh, processing data and sharing data and joint, jointly analyzing data. Um, um, the map on the right hand side uh, shows a preliminary suggested layout for key uh, transects and what we call focus uh, or hotspots uh, with the circles where we think there is a need for extra attention and where uh, institutions that have activities should stop by if they can and do a predetermined pre set of measurements uh, as often as possible. Um, so this is inspired by, uh, by work that has been going on on the uh, Pacific side for quite some time in the uh, Bering Sea and Chuchi Seas. Uh, this has been quite successful for more than 10 years where, where institutions did get together and, uh, and did joint planning and data sharing in a better manner. And there is also a similar initiative between Greenland and Canada, uh, the uh, Baffin Bay Davis Strait uh, Observatory System. And, uh, and we, again, work with them with the, the ultimate aim of joining these three efforts and uh, extending it into the, the deep uh, ocean also on, on the end. The part that is empty now on this map. Um, multiple reasons uh, why we should do this, of course. Better data coverage in itself is good because we can provide more data for the, uh, the end users. Uh, We'll get more out of our own resources and, uh, and we'll also do better science for system understanding. So the, the principle here is to create win-win situations for the people and the institutions involved and also for the funding agencies. Um, so if you're interested in more information about that, you could visit uh, the Arctic Passion website uh, slash ADBO. Um, two quick words about the future. I mentioned autonomous platforms uh, at the very beginning. Uh, so there are initiatives out there to try to help um, gliders, which are autonomous uh, uh, buoyancy propelled devices that can carry instruments or passively drifting uh, uh, sensor packages to help them navigate under sea ice. That's a big challenge. Um, because they cannot go to the surface and find their position through GPS. They cannot transmit their data while they're in the, in the Arctic Ocean. So hopefully in the not too distant future, we will be able to deploy moorings with uh, acoustic transmitters um, so that these devices that float around in the ocean can triangulate their position and uh, hence know where they are so that we know where they collect the data when they finally surface. And in the slightly more distant future, hopefully they can communicate their data to these moorings, which in turn communicate the data to shore. So that's, uh, that's a, a peak view into the, into the future at the end. And with that, I think I will conclude and open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Arend. And the example more in detail uh, about Arctic observing systems and also underlining the importance of collaborations. Um, 
I think due to time issues, I'd like to quickly pass over to Margaret Rudolph and then we can take uh, questions in the very end. Um, yeah, Margaret, um, you're a graduate research assistant at the International Arctic Research, uh, research Center and you're part of the RNA Co-ops project, uh, which she will also talk a little bit more during your talk. Um, so welcome and the stage is yours. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so you have to excuse me, I have a bit of a cold today. So um, so yeah, I am an interstate PhD candidate at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I study co-production of knowledge. Um, and just to give you kind of a bit of the context, um, the project I work on is RNA co-ops, which is basically the United States version of Arctic Passion. It has 11 institutes involved, um, about 24 researchers and growing. It is a research networking activity, so it's kind of this expectation of growth. Um, the PI is Hayo Aiken. And then they're in partnership with the Food Sovereignty Working Group, or if we say it shortly, it's FSWG as the acronym. It's an informal network that formed out of Arctic Observing Summit 2020, um, the Food Security Working Group. And we did change our name last year to be a bit more fitting with our, our broader goals. The group has grown um, to, to think about things greater than just Arctic um, observing and more focus on indigenous food sovereignty in general. And just to make it clear, this group is independent from the Alaska Fairbanks, RNA Cobs, and Ceylon Roads. And so between RNA Co-ops and the Food Sovereignty Working Group is an indigenous liaison team. There's myself as the science technical lead, um, Craig Trithlook as the community engagement lead, and Victoria Bushman as the international engagement lead. And so kind of playing off the framework, Lisa's kind of started with this is um, the why. What is the driving work, what is driving the work um, and doing these types of projects as well as say on roads and it's to have a positive impact for Arctic indigenous peoples. And um, I wanted to speak a bit on kind of what is um, indigenous law systems. This is very much just touching the surface of what it is from an indigenous perspective, kind of the way they talk about it is relationship, reciprocity, and responsibility to the land and waters. It is rooted in observations, um, but it's more, it's different instead of having this written data, it's rooted in experiential knowledge and oral traditions. It's 10,000 years of knowledge. So it really is a long-term sustained observation system. And there should be a goal of supporting 10,000 more years in this context of allowing indigenous people, um, supporting indigenous people living on the lands and practicing traditional harvesting and um, continuing to be in the Arctic. And so really kind of when you start breaking it down, indigenous knowledge systems are Arctic observing systems. They have observations, they do processing, they do sharing, and then they also are used with themselves. And so when you kind of break it down that way, you kind of see that it is equivalent to a more science-based Arctic observing system. It's just in a different cultural context. And then there's also the element when thinking about what should be studied in Arctic observing. Indigenous people are rights holders, not stakeholders. Observing systems does and should impact policy decision-making at multiple levels, whether at the community level, regional, international. Um, Mikhail kind of touched a bit on the international and maybe more European side but there's all these the very complex policy aspects that we're looking at. And then these policies then impact Arctic indigenous peoples. And so really Arctic indigenous peoples have an invested interest in making sure that the best possible science is happening because that's what's gonna be available to decision makers. And then kind of circling back to then what would be impacting indigenous people in the Arctic. And kind of how they, how, how they kind of decide what should and shouldn't be studied if you're working with them 
is really from their indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge, again, is also like holistic. And so they're able to see connections between things, um, you know, temperature and wildlife impacts, those different kinds of things. And they're also generally the first aware of changes in the Arctic. And so they're really fundamentally part of these discussions. And all this kind of works into the roads guiding principles, which focus on equitable partnerships and funding for indigenous peoples, broadly shared benefits, um, complementing and integrating existing networks this includes indigenous knowledge systems, a stepwise development and flexible evolving that allows for grassroots identification of foci and so this kind of speaks to co-production knowledge and working with indigenous people and how we go about kind of thinking about how we improve Arctic observing. And kind of then going into the how, what are the defining factors in working with indigenous people, both between RNA co-ops, our depression, as well as the broader um, say on roads. Is equity for indigenous people um, is I think fundamental part of this. Um, it's honoring Indigenous sovereignty because it's important to support self-determination of Indigenous people because they exist in a context of colonization. And if you're thinking for ultimate positive impacts, it is supporting their sovereignty and self-determination. It is having community-driven topics and methods and being generally grassroots and not top-down. Um, it is doing co-production of knowledge, which fundamentally is partnering with communities, having a shared decision-making and co-producing every step of the research process. It is also including indigenous ethics and best practices. And it's something to think about regionally because each indigenous group, you know, they're not a monoculture and they have different ethics and best practices. A lot of them are already, already established to follow. And this is kind of more different from Arctic Passion is RNA Cobbs and the Food Sovereignty Working Group is really focused on the food aspect and where it's different in the Arctic and with indigenous people is the wildlife management. This includes fisheries, um, which was a question in the chat and decision-making because ultimately that's one very large aspect indigenous people care about in the Arctic is being able to continue practicing traditional harvest and living on the land and have, being in relationship with the land. And this is kind of bringing in my own research into this on co-production, which is looking at the cultural differences to research. When you look at a natural scientist, they're generally trained in post-positivist um, worldview and research paradigm. And they generally prioritize outputs of a project, the deliverables. Credibility comes from the scientific method and the peer review process. Legitimacy is having independent scientific research. Relevancy is supplying scientific information only. There's kind of still a lingering sense that science is separate from policy. And I think Seon Rhodes and the two projects are kind of working and understanding how science and policy work together. Versus when you look at indigenous researchers, including this would be including indigenous community leaders, they generally have this mindset as well, is that they prioritize the inputs. Basically, even before you submit a proposal, the relationship building, the partnership, deciding what gets studied and how, that's what they prioritize. Um, the credibility to them comes from co-production knowledge process. They look at projects and whether they're indigenous led or not. And to them, that kind of decides what they think is credible or not. Legitimacy comes from equitable decision making, equitable indigenous participation in a shared decision making process. And then relevancy is connected to kind of their daily lives, what they consider kind of the real world and not just in papers and academic, as well as in the policy and decision making. And so kind of the approach the liaison team is taking to implement a culturally responsive co-production knowledge process is really focusing on the relational trust 
that is needed for perceived credibility, legitimacy, and relevancy. And um, then kind of through, through that process of relational trust, that's what leads to the use of the outcomes and long-term impacts that are positive for um, Arctic Indigenous peoples. And so the liaison team approach, kind of our first step was understanding the context, you know, what, is our, what has happened in Arctic observing summits, what is stay on roads, understanding the policy aspects. So fisheries has been a big topic for us. And then starting to build relationships and trust and participating in indigenous led initiatives, whether they're research or other initiatives, um, narrowing the themes for expert panels through informal discussions. And so just starting to talk about say on roads and kind of soliciting maybe what kind of things they'd be interested in participating in say on roads and then starting to formalize those partnerships. And then really at this point you need to pause and that's kind of where we're at and because the kind of the next steps and how the expert panels kind of evolve and having discussions of how we improve Arctic observing really needs to have co-produced goals and methods. And so consideration for say on roads is um, it takes time to build trust. Um, there's a saying from an indigenous elder like um, Adelaide Herman, you have to go slow to go fast. And so really taking the time that build that trust, which is very difficult with constrained timelines and everything, both Arctic Passion and Arnett Cobbs already funded. And so I think there's been a lot of discussions of, you know, how do we take time to build this trust as well as thinking to the recommendations we have for future initiatives under Stay on Roads and lessons learned. Making sure you're engaging in, in existing initiatives. I think indigenous leaders are already doing a lot. And so I think it's the researcher's responsibility to um, really look at what's what they're already doing and how we fit with that instead of asking indigenous people to do that kind of heavy left in understanding how they can work with Sioux on roads. And um, this can also be working with existing initiatives that are research and indigenous led that are already going that beyond Arctic Passion and RNA co-ops. Um, and then supporting liaison and boundary spanner leadership. So this is uh, also part of my own research. So boundary spanners bridge the boundaries between indigenous communities and academia and in a lot of context policy. And so they have an understanding of these multiple worlds. They have existing networks of people that they know and can work with. They already had that trust going and they can facilitate cross-cultural work, um, culturally responsive work and methods. And I also kind of wanted to know in this thing, because there's also a misconception that they don't necessarily represent communities. Sometimes they do, sometimes they're a community leader, but oftentimes they are not, such as myself, I'm a researcher. I don't represent a community. And with that, thank you. And I have a couple of our, our two websites up here, which I will, yeah, I will put them in the chat to get shared out. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna jump in here really quickly. Thank you so much, uh, Margaret, for that super interesting presentation. Um, let's see, I think you got a question directly right now. Would you give an example of how can such a long history of environmental and climate change captured and communicated from indigenous holistic perspective? I'm fascinated by and respect very much indigenous knowledge, but I also wonder how this knowledge responds well to the current drastic climate environmental change. Yeah, I think kind of one example that's coming to mind is, um, and this kind of touches in the inequity, is the climate change and fisheries impacts on salmon, particularly on the Yukon River. There's been a huge crash in, in the Yukon River salmon. Um, they haven't been able to fish along the Yukon for the last two years, which is really traumatic um, because that, that's a major part of their, their life ways and the culture. And then, you know, they gather at fish camps and that's 
a huge cultural component and just generational teaching happens there is fundamentally part of the culture. And for a long time, they've been talking about the changes they've been seeing in the salmon and the health, you know, the way it tastes different. The sizes have been dramatically going down. Um, and then just constantly needing, like trying to tell scientists and not really kind of being believed until scientists start studying themselves. And then basically you have almost a decade of lost, of lost action because of that. And generally too, when you're looking at subsistence harvest, the harvest from indigenous people, it's a very tiny fraction of the fisheries, the salmon that gets caught in Alaska waters. And so it is kind of this inequitable thing and it's very frustrating for indigenous people to see all these changes happening to the salmon and trying to tell people that action needs to happen and then kind of not being really heard until they're at the point where they can't even fish anymore because there's a huge crash in the fishery. So that's kind of one example. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't think there's any, uh, yeah. For many not Arctic country researchers, it's very difficult to gain a good picture of the landscape of research institutions related to indigenous people. This makes many times difficult to uh, imagine and organize collaboration. Yeah, I think if that is like your interest to work with indigenous people, it is starting to take the time to educate yourself. And this is unfortunately on top of probably your scientific education. I'm kind of in the same boat. Um, my background is actually in permafrost engineering. So I actually switched gears to my PhD to really focus on these aspects of like, how do we work better with indigenous people and really understanding indigenous methodologies and those aspects. Um, and I think, you know, it has to take time to go in communities, going to conferences that have a lot of indigenous people that already attend. And there are some great science ones such as like Arctic Net in Canada, as well as Arctic, our Alaska Forum in the Environment Alaska. I'm not sure if there's a European equivalent, maybe someone else can answer that. Um, kind of maybe more from North America side and just starting to build relationships and listen to them. And it's just, it's gonna take a lot of time and kind of, yeah. It takes a lot of time. Yeah, thank you. We, uh, I think that's it for the questions, uh, but there was a comment also as part of the SEON work, ICCC and partners created an online data of community-based monitoring, and we're working to update it in case people are interested. The link is in the Q&A. Are there any other comments or answers to the question? Do observation components include fisheries components, even though you addressed it, Margaret? If not, I think that's it for questions. So I'll stop talking. Yeah, Vito, um, I guess there are some texts and stuff like that about indigenous methodologies, if you Google that as like a term. Maybe that's what you're trying to ask. Yeah, Michael. Please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Margaret and and Arit and everyone. Uh, also to the other to the participants for for the good questions. I would just like to to add on to this topic of um, the time needed and the openness needed for for understanding each other and and trying to make the best out of all the available knowledge systems and. That is something which does not only take time from the indigenous and local groups and the researchers to do that, but it would also require that the funding agencies are modifying their funding schemes in a way that a real early involvement, maybe already the formulation of scientific calls or tenders um, are made in a way that uh, people, local and indigenous groups can in, get involved already to formulate the research questions or the observing system questions, which are uh, have, having to dealt, we, we have to deal with as, as projects, which then apply for those calls. And then it goes on in the projects themselves. If you have a four year project and you 
can do collaboration only if uh, you have already existing long-standing relationships that is somewhat difficult and so uh, and also it needs uh, this intercultural work uh, even more so than than intersectoral work work or interdisciplinary work needs time which uh, then is taken away in a, in a certain uh, way from the research itself but it will improve the quality of the research in the end. And this is something the funding agencies um, should take into account when they um, you know, calculate the budgets for the projects which are needed to do work. So if uh, there are intercultural, interdisciplinary components involved, there needs to be more time for uh, learning from each other and, and understanding each other's uh, knowledge systems. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, funding pre-activities and pre-efforts um, before a project uh, will get funded. Um, Aru, do you want to add something here or? No, not really. I think perhaps just a brief comment on the question about uh, fisheries uh, um, as part of the observational system. I would say that uh, in terms of um, fish stocks being part of the ecosystem, yes. <clears throat> but when it comes to actually in a more targeted man manner looking at commercial fish stocks, then that's typically the, the mandate of national uh, uh, entities, institutions that, uh, that uh, chart these and, and give the management advice, et cetera. And, uh, and then the international organizations uh, um, connecting the dots between the, the national pieces of the puzzle. So um, it's not per se a targeted part of the work that we do within our passion. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, we learned that Arctic observing systems uh, are quite complex from different scales globally to local, um, but that they are also, and especially the collaboration in between and the connectedness um, is very important um, to get the best out of it um, and yeah to support each other um, having the same goal yeah and I think with that I'll uh, like to thank all of the three speakers Michael, Arvid and Margaret and Sabrina um, as uh, support and I'd like to thank you all for your time and your interest and yeah have a good continuation of the day and um, take care all together bye bye thanks a lot bye bye